I'm Carrie Magruder, Curator of the History of Science Collections of the University of Oklahoma Libraries. and We're a, a premier research uh, facility in the field of the history of science with nearly 100,000 volumes stored in two climate-controlled vaults. We're part of a history of science program that brings students and scholars from around the world to use these books. Galileo's first book is here. It's, it's his rarest book. It was printed in only 60 copies. It's called On the Geometrical and Military Compass, The Operation of the Compass, Geometrical and Military by Galileo Galilei, printed in the Republic of Venice at the University of Padua in 1606. But I'd like for you to note if you, if you were here and would rub your finger across some of the letters like that O. The type was very crisp, the metal type. that It bit into the paper and you can feel every crease. You could almost read this blindfolded. And that's because this is the first copy off the press. This was the copy that Galileo corrected. It had, it's his own copy, it's his proof copy, and it contains corrections in his own hand that are found in every other printed copy of this book. So this is the first book that Galileo wrote and, and his own copy of it. The second, oh, oh, let me show you a later edition of it includes a depiction of the instrument. It's an ancestor of the slide rule with two arms that would pivot and it was useful for a, a wide variety of tasks, including surveying uneven topography, building fortifications in a field, estimating elevations and distances. Uh, it's a remarkable instrument, so this book is the manual for how to use it. The instrument was, was um, uh, publicized by one of Galileo's students who plagiarized this manual, translated into Latin, and made it look like he himself was the inventor of the instrument. So Galileo's second book was a defense by Galileo Galilei, a Florentine nobility, against the calumnies and impostures of Baltasar Capra from Milan. So this is where Galileo explained court proceedings in Venice that proved that he was the original inventor of the instrument and not Capra. And uh, this, this is Galileo's handwriting. He, he gave this copy to a friend of his who was a physician in Venice. It's bound with his copy of his first book. So the first two books of Galileo both contain his own handwriting, both quite rare, written when he was an obscure mathematician in the Republic of Venice. Now what made him famous overnight was this third book, one of the most famous books in the history of science. It's the earliest published report of observations made with a telescope. With the telescope, Galileo observed patterns of light and shadow on the moon that showed that the moon has real surface topography that white spot would be a mountain peak illuminated by the sun. The white triangle pointing toward it, that would be, be foothills rising, rising toward the peak. The next night it might look something like this, where two chains of mountains are converging toward it. And the night after that it might look something like that, which we call a crater. So Galileo wasn't mapping the moon here, he was showing that there's something there to be mapped. And this discovery set off a 17th century race to the moon. Not a race to go there, but a, a race to map it. So mathematicians across Europe were c persuaded by Galileo's argument that the moon was not smooth like a marble, as the physicists said, but it was uh, uh, rough and earth-like, and maybe the earth also could be a heavenly body if the moon were a heavenly body. The Grand Duchess, Christina, of the, of the Medici family began to be uneasy about Galileo's defense of Copernicanism. 
she had some advisors who told her that, that to think of the sun being in the center of the universe was contrary to scripture. So Galileo wrote a letter to the Grand Duchess Christina that circulated in manuscript and was only published posthumously. This is the first printed edition of it, which, in which he showed that Scripture tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And the Bible is true, but, and it never errs, but its interpreters sometimes err. And there's a unity of truth between science and scripture if both are interpreted correctly, so that one should never let what is obscure in one interpret what is uh, clear in another. Uh, the, this uh, uh, study of scripture and science was endorsed by uh, Pope John Paul II in 1992. Uh, and he cited St. Augustine throughout. Uh, his method of approaching scripture had a long-standing tradition behind it. I've mentioned Copernicus several times, and so at this point I'd like to uh, show you the first edition of Copernicus's work, Nicholas Copernicus on the Revolutions of the Celestial Orbs, printed in Nuremberg in 1543. This is the famous page that shows the depiction of a sun-centered universe. The sun moved out of the heavens and put right in the center. The earth is now revolving around the sun once a year, rotating on its axis once a day, and the moon is now a satellite going around the earth. And yet there's an order and simplicity that is quite compelling in this diagram. This is an appropriate time to talk about it because as a result of the last book and various machinations against Galileo led by physicists, both from the universities and outside the universities, uh, Galileo was summoned to, to hear a decision by the Inquisition to place the work of Copernicus on the list of prohibited books until it could be corrected. And this copy has been corrected. This was in 1616. So starting in 1616, this book was suspended. But, but, four, but 10 corrections were issued by the Inquisition four years later in 1620. And this is a, one of them. It's a very typical one. Where Copernicus says in this chapter heading that it's a demonstration of the triple motion of the earth you can see written by hand up above is a correction, and that's one of the corrections mandated by the Inquisition. That has been changed to say, demonstration of the blank triple motion of the earth. That blank, that word, you can almost guess what it is without me telling you, and it's hypothesis. So now this heading says, the hypothesis of the triple motion of the earth. Let's just interpret it hypothetically, and then there are no problems. So in 1620, with these ten corrections released, even Galileo uh, could begin to discuss uh, and read and uh, argue about Copernic Copernicus again, as long as he did so hypothetically. Now, annotations in a book are quite valuable to us. We don't seek to collect clean copies because to study a book historically, it's, very, it's quite valuable to have the evidence of early readers. So we know that some reader in 1620, the, perhaps the owner of this book at that time, was likely a Catholic who wrote in the corrections mandated by the Inquisition. But this copy of Copernicus is, is remarkable for many reasons. Uh, there are there are annotations throughout in different hands. And these annotations, we now know thanks to the, to, to the path-breaking work of Owen Gingrich, who has done a census of every copy of Copernicus. These annotations come from within, within a decade of the publication of this book in 1543, long before Galileo. And they're from a circle of astronomers working in Paris. And they mastered the book. They make some corrections.
corrections to it that are accurate. They clearly regard it as the point of departure for future research. So this is like looking over the shoulder of the initial Catholic reception of Copernicus in France. And so this copy is causing scholars to rewrite the story of the reception of Copernicus. Now the corrections to Copernicus mandated by the Inquisition came out in 1620. In 1623 an event happened of momentous importance that gave Galileo and his friends new confidence. One of the cardinals who had defended Galileo in the, that first run-in with the Inquisition was Maffeo Barberini. And Maffeo Barberini became elected Pope, took as his papal name Urban VIII. So the accession of Urban VIII to the papacy signaled a new era for Galileo and for the discussion of Copernicus. So they would have expected that the links would flourish under his papacy. Unfortunately, for, for a variety of complicated reasons, that was not the case. Galileo met with the new pope and received his personal permission to write a book about Copernicus, so long as he wrote it hypothetically. And this is the book that resulted. It's the dialogue on the two chief systems of the world. Copernicus, dressed in Catholic garb, is here holding a sun-centered model of the universe. And on the left, you can barely see it, but there's an armillary sphere, an earth-centered model of the universe and it's held by figures that are labeled Ptolemy and Aristotle. So those are the two chief systems of the world, but it's written not as a dry scientific disquisition, but it's a dialogue written not in Latin but in Italian. It's dedicated to the Grand Duke. There are permissions to publish from the Vatican and from censors in Rome and in Florence. It begins with a letter to the discerning reader by Galileo in which he says this is a dialogue and it's all hypothetical, as the Pope had requested. But it's, it's written between three characters, Salviati, who speaks for Galileo, Segreto, Simplicio, a simple-minded man who doesn't even understand his own arguments, and he, he defends Aristotle and Ptolemy. So Galileo, in this book, argues for Copernicus in no uncertain terms, and despite the preface, it's anything but hypothetical. So when this book was published in 1632, uh, the Pope was angry that Galileo had broken his promise to treat it hypothetically. Galileo's enemies joined together, and the result was his trial. So this is the book he was put on trial for. And this also is a copy that contains his own handwriting. Here we have a new sentence by Simplicio to go before this speech by Salviati. And there are many other marginal annotations as well. So this is like uh, being able to look over his shoulder in the months leading up to his trial to perhaps uh, glean some inkling of what he was thinking. I'd also like to just make the point that we don't just collect first editions. So if we're going to study the history of Galileo's ideas, we need the translations of Galileo and the later editions to understand how Galileo's ideas were received and appropriated and used in different cultural contexts. So I brought out one translation, the earliest English translation of Galileo. This was printed in 1661 in London, but it was produced by John Salisbury. And it includes the, the system of the world in, in four dialogues. This is the book he was put on trial for. And it includes other short works by Galileo and a few, few things by others as well. For example, it includes his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, printed in English in the very first first publication of Galileo's works in English. However, the book itself is quite rare because most copies perished in the Great Fire of London. And we can see from the binding and from the edge of the book that this copy also is charred. 
It's been rescued from a fire. We don't know if it was the Great Fire of London that left its mark on this copy, but, but in all likelihood, that's the case. Oh, if we only knew the stories of the people who had preserved the copies of the books in the collections.